What is important for us is to open the door to our blessed Lord, the door of our very being, so that we become one with him. There's a very famous painting in St. Paul's Anglican Cathedral and Bishop Dolan, who has just made the new Archbishop of New York, used the same words. He said, there is our Lord in his raiment, with his crown on his head, and a light in his hand comes to a door that is overgrown with, um, well, I suppose ivory or something like that. But the real crux of the matter is that the door has no handle but he's knocking. And so for each one of us, for you, for myself, and all who are gathered here, this is a time when the Lord is going to knock and ask you to be even closely, more closely involved in his life and in the life of the church. The bishop made some very nice remarks about the people who went to meet our Holy Father but what was most interesting about it was the fact that when they came home, these same people who would sit Sunday after Sunday in the pews and not say anything, were prepared to stand up and share with the adults in the community their experience. What had changed them? These little mice who normally scuttle in just on time and scuttle out after communion, they were, had been impressed. Why? What had caused that? And it's quite interesting is that each one of them said it was the catechesis that the bishops gave to us as we were preparing for our Holy Father's coming. At a catechesis, I may, it makes me search my soul because every Sunday I preach which is supposed to be catechesis but <laughs> it doesn't have much effect really same old face not the same old jokes because I don't tell jokes when sermons but the thing is that that's catechesis but they didn't recognize it for what it was they go to a Catholic school which we spend millions on keeping it going and they have Christian doctrine, catechesis. They come from homes that are very good where their parents teach them to their, say their prayers and to live by the virtues that they hold as dear, catechesis. So what do we have to do to try and set their hearts on fire? Do you realize that this gathering of yourselves, I know small on a Friday night, but still it is the beginning, the powerful beginning, and it will be more tomorrow and Sunday. But the thing is, why do they come? Why do you come? Because you hunger for God's word being shared with you. And I think in this year of St. Paul, we probably have the most graphic description of how Christ can affect us. As you know, St. Paul was a very strong Jew and he regarded these Christians as an aberration something that was destroying the great traditions of Moses and all the other prophets. He couldn't see any good in them at all. He may have seen Christ when he was a boy, but it's doubtful. And we know how adamant he was and how brutal he was in pursuing them, those followers, of, as he said, of the way. We know that at the stoning of Stephen, he was there and gave approval of it. He was only young. But when he got going, he would search the Christians out, have them put into prison, God knows, probably put to death by stoning. 
until one fateful day when on the road to Damascus with the writs for a rest in his pocket he was struck from his horse and blinded. And the voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That one personal pronoun changed his life. Me. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul therefore knew from then on that everybody who was a follower of the way, ones who were baptised, who were members of the community, of the faithful, that if they were touched, they were, people were touching Christ. And this is really the basis of this catechesis for the young people to understand their dignity. And St. Paul gives that as a brave example to them all when he says, do you not realize that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? In other words, God dwells in us if we are free from sin. And the third person of the Blessed Trinity is there in our very being. And then in your home, Remember, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. It's your little church. You are a tabernacle yourself. You are a church. And then when you come to the Eucharist in your parish church, the thing is that you have something even greater. You have his physical presence there. So when we talk about unless the Lord builds the house, it's not just about you know, the structures of the church, new schools, new churches. I know that they're all necessary. I know that they're all wonderful. But what is more wonderful are the people that are in the schools, the people that are in the churches. That's the church. The church building is really a place of assembly. And so if we can try and understand that the catechesis is not so much about just knowing, it's about doing. The two go like a horse and buggy together. It's one thing to know your faith, but then it's the other thing to live it. And that is why they talk about the young people who have been to meet the Holy Father, who will probably only happen once in their life, and all the efforts their parents made to send them by scrimping and saving, the thing is that they were given a legacy. And like any legacy that's given to us, we treasure the one who gave it to us. And he gave it on the cross. You see, the difficulty I feel with a lot of people nowadays, especially our own people, without talking about anybody else, is the thing is everybody loves Jesus but they're not so keen on the church, the structures, the seeming governance and so forth. Because we live in an era when the secularism is like a fog. It just creeps up and goes around everybody. And so we can get lost in the fog of the secularism that is amongst so many of our dear people in New Zealand and in the Western world. So it's a matter of really striving to the best of our ability by our prayers, not only to believe, but to live it. To live it. Live our faith. And we know that the church is important. The community is important because our Lord said to Peter, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. He uses the word. He left us a community spirit. Now you know within the community there are a lot of people who do a lot of good for others. They have that spirit. Now we should be leaders in that spirit as far as the faith is concerned. It's not to be hesitant about the way in which we love God, but rather to be open. You know when people say, oh you've got this convention, what's it all about? And this can be clergy as well as anybody else just quietly. You know, is it necessary? You know, why don't you just have it on a Sunday or something like this, cut it down? 
But the thing is they don't realize that you're here because you have a hunger. You're here because you want with each other to get that stimulus of faith going again. You know the signs of the church. She's one, she's holy, she's Catholic, she's apostolic. When we talk about being apostolic, we realize that the bishops are direct descendants of the apostles. And that charism is to be leaders. So when our bishops speak, and especially our great bishop, Benedict, a bishop of all bishops, the thing is that we must listen carefully. We must understand that they're not speaking from a position of wanting to control or wanting power. They're wanting to lead. That's why the bishop carries a shepherd's crook. It is not something to belabor us with, but rather to hook us back into the reality of life. See, as Catholic, we know that throughout the whole world there are many, many people who follow Jesus in our faith. It is therefore universal wherever you go. Whether it be Borneo and you have Mass in a long hut, you go to Fiji and you have it in a bure, you go into France and you have it in an ancient cathedral, or you come to New Zealand and you have it in churches that are old, and churches that are new. Wherever it is, we know where our home is. And if you ever travel abroad, you will find that is very important. It is your home, away from home. It's Catholic, it's, it's holy. We have the means of holiness in the sacraments. We start with baptism that unites us with Christ. We have confirmation that ensures the Spirit of God is in the temple of our body. We have the Eucharist, which is the culmination of it all, where he gives himself to us. When you've said Mass for many years, the thing is that you, slowly but surely as you're getting older, find as a priest that when you're behind the altar, the safest place to be on earth. And to see the people coming to receive the Lord is an inspiration. Their hands reaching out, some delicate hands, some hard laborers' hands, mechanics' hands, carpenters' hands, wolfies' hands, gentlewomen's hands. All these things are there. And you know, be inspired by this as they are coming to receive the Lord and you have the privilege of giving him to them. And of course, the greatest mystery of all, all is this, that when we look at the universe and we see the galaxy of stars that we are in, we know that there are other galaxies outside. And we know that God created this. And if we want to really understand how much he loves us, that God comes when the priest calls him. When he says, this is my body, God comes. He cannot refuse. Do you understand that? This is, we're talking about God, not just the Queen of England or the Pope or any other body that thinks they're important. No, this is God who comes and so gives us an understanding of what is necessary for us is to give ourselves totally to God. All right. The thing is that that's all really what I had to say to you. Remember, you are temples of the Holy Spirit. Your home is a little church. Your church is a community of the faithful together. Now, what is important is when Paul said to Jesus, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. And in that word, in that name, is salvation. 